I worked as a bartender in pubs and nightclubs for the better part of 11 years, and I loved and hated it in equal measure. I fell into it when I was 19, simply as a way of getting access to beer and the money to buy it, and through a mix of comfort and apathy I just sort of stayed there until I really found my passion in life. Bartending is a difficult and sometimes dangerous profession. There's a lot of stuff that can either burn or cut you, and then you just got to carry on working with a bunch of salt, citrus juice, and hard liquor. And needless to say, bartending significantly increases your pain threshold, and that's just one of the many things that sucks about it. But then there's a lot of good that comes with it too. The hours might be antisocial, but if you're working with a good team, it's basically getting to party with some of your best friends every night, with the only real work being the cleanup at the end. It also turned me from something of a shrinking violet into a full-on social butterfly, and for that, I owe a great deal to my time behind the bar. It's also given me a lot of funny stories to tell at parties, but also a whole bunch of stories that are more suited to some creepy campfires on Halloween night, if you catch my drift. There's the guy who set himself on fire messing around with flaming cocktails. I don't just mean his hands or his arm either. I mean his face and neck were just on fire before someone ran to throw some water on him. When we finally put the flames out and got him sat down somewhere, he started to have a seizure from how bad the pain was. Then there was the time I had to perform surgery on myself after I got a chunk of glass in my hand. I don't deserve too much pity here, as I probably could have gone to a doctor, but money was tight and I was real cheap back then so it is what it is. The worst part was thinking that I'd gotten all the glass out, going home, taking a shower, and then being able to feel that something else was in there once the initial swelling went down. I used a pair of pliers to dig into the wound, take a grip of this little small chunk of glass, and I pulled it out. And I felt that tug, dude. I felt it smushing up against raw flesh and muscle as I tugged on it, and the pain was just on another level completely. There was the guy who lost his ear. I repeat, lost his ear when he fell down a set of stairs that just so happened to have broken glass on it. Being told that I had to clear the area so I could search for a severed human ear was definitely one of the lower points of my career in bartending. Another fun fact, no one ever found it, meaning it either fell into a crack somewhere and just dried up I guess, or somebody found it, picked it up, and took it home with them. But I think the scariest thing I came up against was a man who ignored the smoking ban. I was working in a country pub at the time, which amounted to me taking a break from the heavier but better paying nightclub work for about a year. The venue was incredible, a 300 year old inn that's recently been renovated, so all the decor had this ancient feel to it, all the fittings were good as new. The only trouble was, it was very quiet in the early week, to the point where I had to close early on more than one occasion just to keep the overheads down. There was this great old horseshoe-shaped bar with stained glass fixtures, with one side facing the back rooms, with the other side facing the front. The front bar was definitely the nicer of the two, and the room it faced had these big open windows which looked out onto the front car park. The punters were lovely, the shifts never got crazy busy, the management was really really chill, it was just an overall great place to work. I suppose then that it's Saad's law that the nicest place I ever worked was the place I suffered through one of the most bone chilling events I've ever experienced. But life just has to work that way sometimes doesn't it? It was one of those quiet weeknights I was telling you about, a Tuesday actually and by about 9ish. The last of the regulars had finished their pints, said goodnight, and walked out the door. It was coming up on the end of June, so I remember the sky still being a hazy blue when I considered locking up for the night. The likelihood of anyone else stopping in was extremely low, but in all honesty, I was really getting sick of losing out on the extra hour's pay just to save management a few quid in wages. I decided to stay open, but to get most of the breakdown done so that when it finally came time to close the doors... I'd be 90% ready to clock out. And then lo and behold, just as I'm breaking down the front bar, a car rolls into the car park out front. Two people were in it, a man and a woman, but only the man got out and walked towards the pub. He was on the phone, talking as he walked towards our front doors, while the woman I presumed was his wife just laid snoozing in the passenger seat. 
It's worth noting at this point that I only got a brief look at the guy and his missus when they first appeared. Moments after I saw them, I rushed to put the nozzles back on the draft beer pumps, thinking the bloke might want a quick half pint before carrying on with his drive. I know drink driving is a bit of a taboo subject in the city, but out in the country, you'd be surprised what people try and get away with. Anyways, the bloke comes up, walks up to the bar, hanging up his phone call as he does so. I give him a big smile, ask him when I can get him, and his reply just about knocks my socks off. Bearing in mind I'm expecting a half pint, maybe a bottle of beer, then something non-alcoholic for the wife to drink when she wakes up. So when he replies, two double scotch and a pint of your strongest ale, I was quite obviously very surprised. I asked him very politely if he thought that was a good idea, what with him being behind the wheel and everything. From the look of him, I was a bit worried that he'd take offense to my challenge, but to my relief, he just smiled and said, I'm not doing any more driving tonight, mate. If that was the case and his wife was switching over as designated driver, then fair play. But if he got behind the wheel after I closed up, I was most definitely calling police. So I give the guy his drinks and he goes fishing in his pocket for his wallet. But instead of taking his money, I told him that he could just settle up at closing time, as by that point, we only had about 20 minutes of service left. He agrees, then I go off to do something on the back bar. I return a few minutes later. Both glasses of scotch are empty and the pint is half drank. But the second I catch the guy's eye, he orders another round. Another pint, another round of whiskey and beer, presumably all for himself. I remember asking him something like, Bloody hell, Mike, a long day, is it? It was a rhetorical question, really. You could just see it on his face that he'd had a long, bloody day, and he just gave me this muted grunt in reply. I got him his drinks, tabbed up his second order, then unsuccessfully tried making a bit of small talk. It's force of habit, really, trying to talk my way into a bit of gratuity, but this bloke didn't fancy it at all. I asked him where he was coming from, then where he was going. Both of his replies were one-word answers. I then asked just to confirm if it was his wife that would be driving on the next leg of their journey. He only replied with, X, as in it was his ex-wife. I apologized to him, mostly for assuming, but also because it might have brought back some painful memories of their divorce. But strangely, for the first time since he'd walked in, he actually gave something resembling a smile. I walked off feeling very awkward, as anyone would do if they'd broached on a touchy subject, but then moments later I started to smell cigarette smoke. I think smoking in pubs was banned in back in like 2007 here in the UK, and this was a few years after that, so especially as a non-smoker, the smell hit me like a ton of bricks. I walked around to the front bar only to see the guy just sitting there, more empty glasses in front of him just puffing on a cigarette like it was the most normal thing in the world. I'll be honest, I was a bit annoyed with him. I thought that he was just an alright bloke having a horror of a day, but he knew damned well that he shouldn't have been lighting up inside like that, and the position it put me in as the only member of staff present. I asked him to put the cigarette out, again trying to sound as non-confrontational as possible. And that's when I spotted it. The white part of his cigarette was a deep red, as were the fingers that held it. I realized the same red smears were covering his empty glasses too. I was taken back, but more concerned for the man's health than anything else. I asked him if he was okay and if he needed me to grab the first aid kit or call an ambulance. He just shook his head, carried on smoking his cigarette for a moment and then said, It's not my blood. I must have instinctually backed off when he said that because he was quick to follow up with, Don't worry. The police are on their way. I wanted to ask him what had happened, but I was raised to recognize that there are some questions you just don't ask. Whatever had happened, he was okay, and if his wife was well enough to take a nap, then... And that's the point that I realized that his wife wasn't napping. If something serious had just happened to them, serious enough that blood had been spilled, then there's no way that she'd be in the mood for a quick snooze. No sooner had I realized it had the blue flashing lights appeared in the car park in front of us. Then as six officers emerged from three cars and headed towards the pub, 
The man pulled out his wallet and placed a trio of blood-smeared twenties on the bar top. I didn't say a word of thanks. I was in a state of complete shock. I simply watched the guy walk out to meet the policeman. Then I watched them put the handcuffs on him and take him away. Obviously, I had to hang around to talk to the police, but I took the time to call the pub's landlord who lived in a village nearby. She drove down right away and was great help because I could finally drive back home to decompress. The worst part, without a shadow of a doubt, was having to walk past the couple's parked car as I walked to my own. I try not to look at the woman's body, but I couldn't help myself and it was only when I was up close that I saw the blood that had soaked into the shredded piece of clothing she was wearing. I remember getting to my car, reaching for my keys and finding that my hands were shaking too much to get them into the ignition. It all seemed like a bad dream I just hadn't woken up from yet. I'd been staring at a dead body, then trying to make small talk with the man who'd made it. He could have just as easily decided he didn't want to go to jail and that he needed to eliminate me as a witness, only he didn't, and the phone call that he'd been on as he walked into the pub had been with the police, arranging to turn himself in. It turned out that the wife had been subjected to some serious domestic abuse over the years and the husband had a habit of hitting her in front of the kids. So, she talks him into going for a drive one day and when they're far away from their kids, she drops it on him that she's going to leave him and take the kids too. But then instead of accepting it or vowing to fight her in court, the guy takes a screwdriver from a toolbox from his boot and stabs his wife to death with it. Then, before turning himself into the police, he drives to some little country pub and has one last pint before the police come to take him away. If I'd had any idea, I'd never have served him those drinks, but that also reminds me. The money he dropped onto the bar, the stuff with the blood on it, I asked the officers if they needed to take it as evidence or something. One of them took me aside and told me that officially speaking, he should take it, but they had plenty of evidence in the car and on the bloke's clothes, so as much as it might seem in bad taste, I could just wash it off, ring it up, and keep the change. The bill only came to over 40 quid, so it was a lot of change to keep, but in words of that one policeman, I imagine he appreciated the pint of lager, as it'll be the last one he has for quite some time. Back in the early 90s, I used to work at this really sketchy bar down in Nogales, Arizona. For those of you unfamiliar with the place, Nogales is a town of two nations. About two-thirds of the town lies south of the border in Mexico, while the upper third is in the United States. The border cuts right through the town where North Grand Avenue meets the Mexican Highway 15, and while there are the usual checks and searches, it's almost like the border doesn't even exist at all for some people. They move to Nogales del Sur, apply for a green card, then just hop over the border to Nogales del Norte to find work. Sure, it could mean being stuck in some pretty heavy traffic sometimes, but trabajar in the U.S. in the morning and, and be back in Mexico for la cena con la familia in the evening, that's like every migrant worker's dream. Not everyone wants to move to the U.S. For some people down here, it's all about the money. For me personally, I didn't see a future for myself in Nogales, it's a good step up for some people. Migrant work makes a lot of people very wealthy, but it also comes with a serious downside. I can't speak for every town that straddles the U.S.-Mexican border, and there are a few, but Nogales is a very popular spot for narco-traffickers. That means anything from intimidation to having your painful death posted online if you so much as dare to step on their toes. Most people just turn a blind eye do as they're told and reap the benefits of working in a place so flush with commerce. But me, I wanted to get a nice stack of US dollars, then move further north to try to make a life for myself up in Denver or maybe in California. But to do that, I needed a job. I don't know what the rules are these days, but back then, you had much better chances of securing a green card if you landed a job and a work permit first. But that meant having to find someone to employ you, which was way harder than it sounded. Because of the super high demand, almost every job north of the border, no matter how menial, is snatched up almost as soon as it's posted. 
It also became obvious very quickly to me that it wasn't about the skills that you had, it was about who you knew. And in the end, that's how I landed a job at this little bar and cantina called El Camonchero. I had a friend who told me about it, but he also warned me not to take it unless I was desperate. It was night work, meaning I was much more likely to be stopped and searched by border patrol when I drove home late at night. It was also an extremely sketchy place and a bunch of rumors were flying around about it being a front for narcos. These days, I'd lock my kids in a closet before I let them work in a place like that. But I was that dangerous combination of young, extremely dumb, and very ambitious. It makes me cringe to think about it, but I pictured it being like Goodfellas or something. I'd make a few drinks, bus a few tortas, then get tipped in hundreds by all these cash-rich drug smugglers. That wasn't strictly true, but I did make enough money to just get the hell out of there once things turned bad, and boy did they ever turn bad. I was almost 20 years old when I started bartending at El Comonchero, and by 21, I was the GM, the general manager. But understand that sort of rise to power, I have to introduce you to someone called Paco. Paco was a complete, degenerate coke addict. He did absolutely nothing for the business and simply taught me to do everything instead. He was a total pain in the butt, got in the way more than he helped anything, and was probably the reason why the place had problems retaining employees. I knew the place had a sketchy history, and a lot of guys who visited the place were some really scary-looking hombres, but there's no doubt that Paco was the only part of the job that ever made me want to quit. But then one day, Paco was gone. I turned up for work one late afternoon only to find the place was locked and shut. I gave Paco's home phone and pager a call from a payphone, then waited for like an hour afterwards, but he didn't respond to either message. I didn't really want to have to drive back south only to have him call me like, yo, where the F are you? So I figured I just could go grab some food then hang out outside the bar just in case Paco decided to show up. Maybe 40 or 45 minutes go by, I get a bite to eat but there's still no sign of Paco. Then literally right as I'm about to start my engine and begin the journey back home, this pristine 1973 AMC Javelin pulls up outside the bar. This thing is definitely narco, and the tattooed tank of a Mexican guy who got out of it was every bit as intimidating as you might expect. But what was even more unnerving is how he got out, looked around, saw me, and then walked straight over to my car like he knew exactly who I was. When he confirmed who I was, the guy tossed the keys of the bar through the open window and just said, you're the manager now, Paco won't be coming around here no more. And then with me still struggling to comprehend my sudden promotion, I guess, he got back into his vehicle and drove off. Now my starting salary as a GM was just over 36 grand a year, which from what I understand was a lot less than what Paco was getting. But honestly, I didn't care. I'd gone from a few bucks an hour to 700 bucks a week, and all I had to do was keep the place running and just not ask questions. I hired another bartender, a second cook, and we had Taco Tuesdays and Two for One Wednesdays. I was halfway to turning that place into a legitimate business before everything went to crap, and if there hadn't been a clear and present threat to mine and my family's lives, I would have been sadder about having to move on. So we closed up one night, and I was almost at the border crossing on North Grand when I realized I'd left my wallet on the bar the same wallet that had my weekly wages in it, all in cash. Anything else and I've just waited until the next day to pick it up in the morning, but I wasn't about to leave 700 bucks plus tips for our cleaning lady to potentially swipe. Not that I didn't trust her, it's just, you know, that's a lot of cash. I turned off as quickly as I could, then circled back towards the bar to grab my wallet. Bearing in mind that I'd stopped at a 24-hour taco place after work, so I arrived back maybe... 20 to 30 minutes after I'd first locked up, only to find that someone else had come by to open up the bar's front door. When I first saw it, I felt like I was going crazy, because in spite of having a vivid memory of lowering the steel shutters over the door, I had obviously forgotten to do it. It didn't really occur to me that someone else had come by, not until I unlocked the doors, 
walked inside and heard this sort of faint sound of music coming from somewhere in the building. It's only a few feet from the front door to the bar, so I can see my wallet the moment that I walk in there. I walk over, start thumbing through the cash, and it looks like it's all there, but then who's in the building, and where's that music coming from? It was very, very creepy. The only other person who had a key to the building was the owner, so it made sense that it was him if there were no signs of breaking and entering, I guess. But then I also just wanted to make sure that no one had sort of jiggled the padlock, got into our liquor storage, and was now just playing music while drinking themselves to death. I had to walk all the way into the back to find where that music was actually coming from, and when I did, I realized that it was coming from the basement, where we had a cold storage unit for all of our perishables. What the hell someone would be down there for after closing time was definitely a mystery to me, but the music made the whole thing even more confusing. I was actually pretty nervous as I approached cold storage, so the sound of some muted scream coming from inside just about scared me half to death. Someone was in there, and by the sounds of things, they were hurt pretty bad. I know the place had a bad rep, but what would you do, honestly? If you have something that even resembles a soul, you go check it out. Regular people just don't listen to each other hurting, then turn and run the other way. Or if they do, that certainly wasn't me at the time. So I did what I did. I rushed forward, opened up the door to the storage, and after that, everything changed. So I won't dress this up. This is real talk, so I'm not going to give some disgusting and detailed description of what I saw. There were three guys inside the cold storage, and one was being tortured. There was a video camera too, set up on a tripod, and there was blood all over these plastic sheets that they hung up to contain the mess. I just ran all the way out to my car, drove home, and then returned in the morning like nothing had ever happened. Well, not quite like nothing had happened. I went down to that basement feeling my palms getting sweaty as I sort of descended the stairs and went to check the storage. The plastic sheets were gone. Everything had been cleaned down, and it was like nothing had ever happened. I tried to go on working as normal that day, but I couldn't. Not really. It wasn't just the fact that I'd seen something so awful. I barely slept wondering what was going to happen to the bar, which would also probably determine what happened to me, too. I knew early on that I didn't have a choice. Mexico isn't a land of choice. Your options are given to you by those in power, and you just pick the one that hurts the least. And long story short, my options came down to two. Stay on as manager and get a huge pay bump, or leave Nogales forever. If I stayed, I was in, and I was in for life. But leave and my whole family would be killed if the Federales even cruise past their house. I chose leave. Not because I wasn't afraid of putting my family in danger, but because I knew that I could use it to apply for asylum instead of a green card and the same applied to my family. Moving up to Colorado literally the next day, not being able to tell my family what had happened or why I'd quit such a great job, that was a really scary time for me. But ironically, being threatened by the cartel was what got me and my family settled in the US even faster than we would have otherwise. It took a while for the paperwork to process, and I had to talk to a whole bunch of different officials, but in the end, it all worked out for the best. My family slipped away in the night, joined me up in Denver, and we've been living here ever since. I think I was only allowed to leave Nogales and Cartel Association because I wasn't involved in anything too heavy. I think they appreciated what I'd done for the bar and knew I'd be too scared to do anything but disappear. But that was the cartel then, not the cartel now. I'm almost certain that if that had gone down these days, I would not have been allowed to just walk away. I know I've been lucky, unbelievably lucky, and that good fortune has enriched my whole family too. But I only gotta watch a news channel to be reminded that there are so many other families that never get to share in that same good fortune. Some people live their entire lives with the cartel's boot on their neck, and they never find a way out from under it. Back when I was a student, I used to work in this really flashy bar down in London called La Maison. 
It's not there anymore, which is a shame, really, because I've got a lot of happy memories of that place. But I've also got one decidedly unhappy memory of the place, too. Downright terrifying, in fact. I was working a Sunday evening shift after a very heavy Saturday night, and the whole team was just absolutely knackered. Thankfully, so was the rest of London after the night before, so the Sunday ended up being quite an easy shift. Our general manager ended up sending two or three members of staff home, and we ran the place on a skeleton crew until it came close to closing time. Now, I can't emphasize this enough. This place was fancy. We did bottle service, had a VIP section, people queued up for ages to get in during peak hours, and we even had a few footballers drop in every so often, which made the place even more popular with punters. The point is, we made an obscene amount of money over the weekend, so on a Sunday, we had easily had 30 to 40 grand in cash just sitting in the safe upstairs. It's kind of crazy to actually see it, and knowing that amount of money is there makes you think some wild thoughts sometimes, but obviously you never act on them. However, we weren't the only ones who knew that there was a lot of cash there, and they very much were prepared to act on it. At closing time, our two bouncers walk into the men's toilets to check if there's anyone left over. All I heard was shouting, and then the bouncers walked out again, hands in the air. Behind them walked two blokes who had been lurking in one of our corner booths, mostly with their hoods up for the final hour of service. They had their faces covered by that time, and both were holding handguns. They asked who the managers were, which was me and my boss, and they separated us from the rest of the team. Everyone else had their wrists and ankles tied at gunpoint, then the armed men told me and my boss to lead them to wherever the safe was. We did as we were told, but there was a massive problem. The safe in our office was on a time lock, and it was set for half past midnight, meaning the robbers would have to wait about 25 minutes if they wanted their money. Meanwhile, there are five people downstairs, two of whom are bloody great bouncers, and they're all lying on the floor tied up. The robbers wanted the money, and they wanted it right then. Waiting around wasn't part of their plan at all. It went down as you might imagine. I mean, it's a scene that's been in more bank robbery films than I could count. The robbers want the money out of the safe, but the person can't open it. Some of the time, I suppose it's a bluff, and the person can open the safe whenever they want. But ours really was on a time lock, and although there was an emergency override built in, the code was only known to company directors, not GMs. My boss told that to the robbers, but they didn't believe him, and neither were they prepared to just sit around for the better part of half an hour so they could wait for the safe to open. At first, they threatened to shoot my boss and he begged for his life. They thought it was funny. They didn't shoot him, they just slapped him around a bit trying to get him to crack, but all he'd say was, guys, I can't open it, you have to wait, please, just wait. And his pleading only earned him more punches and kicks, then one of the robbers started to choke him, saying he could only breathe again if he agreed to open the safe. No matter what they did, he couldn't do as they asked, but instead of understanding that, they just took it as my boss being brave. They were asking him, why are you protecting someone else's money? And all this stuff saying that he should just give it up and save himself the pain. He wanted to just give them some money, I know he did. We're always told just to hand over any cash in a robbery situation and he'd already given them what we had in the cash drawers. But those guys wanted the safe money and they weren't going to leave without it. Members of the management team often spent long periods of time in the office. You've got orders to send off, RADAs to organize, and dozens of little data input programs on the computer to work with. It gets very boring very quickly, and in a job where you might finish at 3am and be back to work at 2pm for the next day, a lot of tea and coffee is needed both upstairs and behind the bar. To make things easier for us, we kept our own tea and coffee station in the office, and as one of the robbers tried to come up with more and more painful methods of getting my boss to open the safe, his eyes finally fell in the kettle. As our bad luck would have it, we'd only just filled it up only minutes before, as we'd been planning on having a cuppa while we completed the end of night office stuff. The robber just flicked the kettle's switch to reboil the water, picked it up as steam rose from the spout, and then held it over my boss. He asked him one more time to open the safe, and my boss begged him not to, but he poured the water anyway. 
I'd never heard anyone scream like that before, and I couldn't watch. I don't know how much of the boiling water the robber poured over my boss or where it touched him, but I knew it must have been more painful than anything I could possibly imagine. I just kept my head down and cried until one of the robbers grabbed me by the hair, slapped me across the face, and told me to open my eyes. He told me I needed to watch what was happening because if we didn't get the safe open in the next couple of minutes, it was going to happen to me too. I'm not proud of how I acted, and I know that they were giving me an easier ride because I just looked like some little barmaid, but I begged and wailed and screamed for them not to hurt me. I repeated all the stuff about the time lock and how if they wanted the money that they just have to wait. I finished off by begging them not to hurt anyone. It would only make things worse and they just have to wait. I think by that time they had only had a couple of more minutes to wait anyway so after going back down to the bar to check on the people they'd tied up, they returned to the office for the safe money. My boss was in so much pain that he couldn't do it so he had to tell me the codes and things I'd need to do to unlock the big safe. My hands were shaking, but I did it, and when I opened it up, there it all was. My boss later said that since we'd had a particularly good Friday and Saturday that there was probably upwards of 50 grand in there. The two robbers shoved me out of the way, lashed the cash bags into rucksacks that they were carrying, and then simply let themselves out. We rushed to call the police, but it was too late. The people downstairs said they heard a motorbike revving shortly after the robbers left, so they were probably miles away by the time the police and ambulance arrived. With the bar now being a crime scene, we couldn't do any of our usual clean-down duties, but as you can probably guess, we weren't exactly in the mood to carry on working after what we'd just been through, especially me. I was the first to go downstairs to try and untie my colleagues, and... I think they knew something terrible had happened to our boss just from the way I was acting. They kept asking, where's Jamie, is he alright? But I just couldn't say anything. I knew if I did, I just wouldn't be able to function. I'd seen the damage the scalding hot water had done to his face and hands and it was absolutely horrendous. I knew if I tried to tell them I just wouldn't be able to function anymore. Jamie was off work for two months afterward and right when we thought that he'd return, he decided that he couldn't work at La Maison anymore, and in the end, I decided that I couldn't either. Sitting in that office brought back so many bad memories, and I know sometimes the best thing to do is to fight for what's yours and not allow trauma to change your life. But some other times, it really is better to just move on and start again somewhere else. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. In the early hours of October 30th, 2004, 37-year-old David Morley and his friend Alistair Whitside were sitting on a bench near London's Hungerford Bridge. Known to his close friends as Cinders, David was a pillar of London's gay community, and while some might not be familiar with his name, they're familiar with the event he played a central role in. Having moved to London from his native Watford in the late 1980s, David found work as a bartender in the city's Soho district. He was like a duck to water. Gregarious and competent, but more than able to handle himself, David not only proved a natural bartender, but a natural leader too. By 1999, he was the assistant manager of the Admiral Duncan Pub on Soho's Old Compton Street. The almost 200-year-old pub had become one of the most prominent gay bars in all of London, and it was David who was acting as head bartender on the evening of April 30th, 1999. Just after 6pm, one of the pub's regular patrons reported a piece of lost property near one of the tables. The Admiral Nelson's policy on such items was to keep hold of them for a few weeks, just in case the owner returned to collect them. If not, it was down to the nearest charity store with whatever had been left behind. General Manager Mark Taylor had to wade through the Friday evening's crowd to just get to the bag's location, but when he reached down to pick it up, it exploded. Unbeknownst to the pub's occupants, the bag had contained an explosive device made up of firecrackers, pressurized flammable material, and hundreds of three-inch steel nails. The percussive force of the explosion sent flame and shrapnel through the unsuspecting revelers, 
killing three and injuring more than 80 others. David himself suffered extensive burns during the attack, but even so, he was one of the lucky ones. Many of the wounded required amputations, meaning they simply blacked out in the middle of a well-earned pint, only to wake up later in a hospital bed with legs or arms missing. At the time of the explosion, the man who planted the bomb was close enough to hear its detonation, and then with a sense of sick satisfaction, he simply disappeared into the London crowds. The bomber must have believed that he was untouchable. The Admiral Duncan bombing was his third in 13 days, and to his knowledge, the police were nowhere near close to catching him. He returned to a rented room on Sunnybank Road in the ancient village of Cove, Hampshire, and began to plan his next attack. Yet in the wee small hours of the morning, a team of black-clad police officers crept up Sunnybank Road, and in the pitch darkness, they surrounded the suspect's home. When the officer burst into the bedroom of 22-year-old David James Copeland, they were greeted by an eerie sight. Two giant swastika flags covered the entirety of one wall, and on a corner desk there was clear evidence of bomb making. As the heavily armed officers dragged Copeland out of bed and announced that he was being arrested under the Terrorism Act, he told them, yeah, it was all me, I did them. Copeland was discovered to be a member of the UK's ultra-far-right British National Party and was further radicalized after a fellow party member gave him a copy of The Turner Diaries. The Turner Diaries is a 1978 novel by William Luther Pierce which depicts a violent revolution in the United States which leads to the overthrow of the federal government, a nuclear war, and ultimately, genocide. Copeland left the British National Party in 1998, believing them to be liberal in policy and practice. To him, politics was pointless, direct action was required. He downloaded a series of bomb-making pamphlets from the Wild West that was the internet in the late 90s, then began constructing rudimentary test devices in his small one-bedroom apartment. By 1999, just as David Morley had risen to the rank of assistant manager, David Copeland had risen to the rank of regional leader in the UK's underground Nazi movement. But when its membership seemed reluctant to take up arms, Copeland took matters into his own hands. Following his arrest, he admitted being a diehard neo-Nazi, but medical records showed that he was heavily dependent on antidepressive medications and had a history of mental illness. A group of five psychiatrists agreed that Copeland displayed numerous symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia, Yet while there was no dispute that he was mentally ill, but the extent to which he was able to take responsibility for his actions became a matter of serious legal contention. In the end, it was crime writer Bernard O'Mahony who helped secure a conviction, and he did so in a rather unorthodox manner. Bernard assumed the persona of a young woman named Patsy Scanlon and wrote a letter to Copeland in which Patsy professed a romantic interest in him. His chillingly coherent replies were later used as evidence of his sanity, resulting in Copeland's plea of diminished responsibility being rejected. He was convicted of three counts of murder and planting bombs on June 30th of 2000, and was handed six life sentences by the presiding judge, saying he doubted that it would ever be safe to release Copeland back into society. Meanwhile, as Copeland's long and drawn out trial captured the attention of the national media, David Morley was keeping busy. His own wounds had healed, but his work wasn't over. He'd known many of those killed and wounded by the explosion and, and spent a great deal of time comforting and consoling fellow survivors in the months that followed. David was a source of strength for those that needed it, at a time when they needed it most, and for that he was greatly admired and deeply loved. The Admiral Duncan pub remains open to this day, but sadly, David had to move on. There were simply too many bad memories and too many absent friends. Five years after the Soho pub bombing, David was working in another gay bar named Brompton's in Earl's Court. On the night he was sharing a bench with his friend Alistair Whitside, there's a good chance that he'd been working and was simply enjoying a quiet drink with a co-worker. As any city center bartender will tell you, there's nothing quite like a moment of peace and quiet after a night of strong drink and loud music. But for David, that peace was soon shattered by the approach of four youths. 
The group consisted of 14-year-old Chelsea O'Mahony, 21-year-old Reese Sargent, 18-year-old Darren Case, and 17-year-old David Blenman. They approached David and Alistair at around 3.10 a.m., intending to perform a prank involving what was referred to at the time as happy slapping. The term happy slapping refers to a fad originating in the UK during the early 2000s. It involved one or more people attacking a victim for the purpose of recording the assault, usually with a camera phone or smartphone. For the most part, the victim would be viciously slapped, but the attacks quickly escalated into brutal asymmetrical assaults involving stomping and multiple attackers. The young Chelsea O'Mahony was the first to approach David and Alistair, directing them to the smile for the camera as she pointed to one of the teenage boys who was filming the encounter on his phone. The two other boys then proceeded to ambush the older men from behind, punching and kicking them as they fell from the bench. After stealing Alistair Whitside's phone, the group continued to attack David Morley, with witness testimony stating that it was the youngest of the group, 14-year-old Chelsea O'Mahony, who delivered the fatal blows. Once he was unconscious, she began kicking David's head like it was a football. After that, he remained silent and still. Alistair Woodside rushed to contact emergency services, and once an ambulance had been dispatched to their location, David was taken to St. Thomas's Hospital in Lambeth. Emergency surgery was performed, but the surgeons were faced with an uphill battle. David had received a total of 44 separate injuries, including five fractured ribs and a ruptured spleen. One surgeon noted that his wounds were more consistent with those seen after a car accident or someone who had fallen from a great height and was stunned when he heard that David was the victim of an assault. An extensive police manhunt resulted in the arrests of all four suspects, but police failed to find pictures or videos of the attacks on any of the assailants' mobile phones. They denied recording the attack and swore that they didn't mean to kill anyone, but when the full picture of the group's evening activities came to light, it was clear that they were no ordinary children. Between the hours of 2.30 a.m. and 3.20 a.m., the group assaulted eight different people in a spree of violence. They set upon drunks, homeless people, anyone who provided or who appeared remotely vulnerable. The rampage left several hospitalized with one of the victims succumbing to their injuries following emergency surgery, and that person was David Morley. Medical staff did everything they could to keep him alive, but tragically, David was pronounced dead at exactly 7.40 p.m. A man who survived a neo-Nazi bomb attack, snatched away by a pack of feral children. At their trial in January of 2006, a then 15-year-old Chelsea O'Mahony was sentenced to eight years in prison, while her male accomplices were sentenced to 12 years each. The British public were horrified to learn that such a young girl could have been central to such a horrifying attack, yet the causes of her delinquency were obvious. The daughter of two heroin addicts, Chelsea had experienced what one social worker described as a particularly chaotic and fragmented life, but it was no excuse for the horrors she helped inflict on some of London's most vulnerable denizens. On November 5th of 2004, over a thousand people piled into Soho's St. Anne's Church to commemorate David's life and legacy. Those who couldn't get inside would surround the church in a solemn display of respect and solidarity. Several prominent figures gave deeply moving eulogies or speeches, including the mayor of London, who professed to be well aware of David's well-known and well-loved status in the city's LGBT community. But perhaps the most poignant point was made by a close, personal friend. Quote, This is the second time he was in the wrong place at the wrong time, they said. But for so many of us here today, we found David in the right place at the right time and he'll always have a place, a very special place, in all our hearts. On the afternoon of Tuesday, February 9th of 1988, 22-year-old Helen McCourt was finishing up her shift at a branch of a prominent British insurance firm. Prior to her departure from the office, Helen spoke to her mother by telephone and mentioned having a date that night. It was to be the first with a young man that she'd met over the weekend, and naturally, she was excited as she was nervous. 
She caught a bus back to her home of Billinge, a small village of just a few thousand people, nestled in the English county of Lancashire. The route home from the bus stop she alighted at should have taken her just a few minutes, yet Helen was never seen again. To get home, Helen had to walk past a pub known as George and Dragon. A witness later claimed to have heard a scream coming from the pub's vicinity right around the same time that Helen would have been walking past it. They ran out of their homes searching for the source of the scream but found nothing. Then later that night, after failing to return home, Helen McCourt was reported missing. Two detectives from the regional missing persons unit arrived in Billinge and, despite its quaint appearance, they discovered the village had a distinctly sleazy underbelly. Violence, affairs, and bitter inter-family rivalries were commonplace, meaning Helen had many enemies, but none so spiteful as 31-year-old Ian Sims. Ian was the George and Dragon's landlord and primary bartender, and had recently barred Helen from drinking there following a minor disagreement with another patron. According to village gossip, Ian had plenty of reason to despise Helen McCourt, as she'd reportedly rejected his romantic advance in a rather humiliating fashion. Helen was also thought to be the source of several nasty rumors regarding Ian, one of which involved an alleged affair with one of the George and Dragon's barmaids. Ian was married with two young children at the time and naturally took great offense at the accusation. But the more the detectives dug, the more they realized that the rumors were true. Ian Sims was indeed conducting an extramarital affair, and although it wasn't clear how Helen McCourt became aware of it, it certainly provided an ample reason to question him in relation to her disappearance. When he was invited to attend an interview with the local constabulary, Ian seemed only too happy to answer their questions. Yet on the day itself, when subjected to the most basic of questions, Ian Sims became visibly nervous. His reaction was not the indignation of an innocent man, but the white-knuckle anxiety of one with something to hide. Ian's car was promptly seized by the police and following an in-depth forensic examination, tiny drops of dried blood were discovered on the rubber sill of the vehicle's trunk, as well as on the carpet inside of it. Investigators also found an opal and pearl earring hidden away in one of the trunk's corners an earring that had once belonged to the missing Helen McCourt. A matching butterfly clip from this earring was discovered during a search of Ian Sims' apartment, and a deeper forensic examination revealed yet more bloodstains on the floors and walls. Given that the incident occurred prior to the advent of DNA identification techniques, there was no definitive way of determining who the blood belonged to, but there was strong reason to believe that it was Helen McCourt's. A few weeks later, a trash bag containing blood-stained female clothing was found on a riverbank around 20 miles away. The bag contained another item of clothing, a similarly gore-soaked cotton jacket with a name stitched into the collar, I. Sims, it read. The female clothes were confirmed to have belonged to Helen McCourt, with the evidence gaining further significance once fibers from Ian's carpet were discovered on it. Damage to the fabric suggested that Helen's killer had dragged her for a considerable distance, most likely while she was either dead or unconscious. A length of electrical cord was also found among the clothing, meaning in all likelihood, strangulation had been the method of execution. Initially, when confronted with the evidence, Ian Sims denied all involvement, but after his wife confirmed that the blood-stained clothing did indeed belong to him, he was forced to radically change his story. The inconsistency was enough for him to be formally charged with Helen's murder, and the following year his trial went underway. When questioned in court, Ian once again denied all involvement in Helen's presumed murder. To the disbelief of those in attendance, his defense team claimed that someone had broken into Ian's flat to steal his clothes, knowing that finding them would throw the police off their scent. The same person had then stolen her car, used it to dispose of Helen's body, and then disappeared into the ether. Under cross-examination, Ian admitted he'd been in the vicinity of Helen's disappearance and could not explain how his clothes had become stained with blood. He maintained his innocence in spite of that, but it didn't wash with the jury, who returned a verdict of guilty when the time came to do so. 
Ian appealed the verdict, but it was swiftly rejected, and he was sentenced to prison for a minimum of 16 years. Sims might have been in prison, but the McCourt family had yet to bring home their daughter's remains. Helen's mother, Marie McCourt, had since devoted herself to the charity Support After Murder and Manslaughter, which helps the relatives of murder victims come to terms with their loss. She also spent a great deal of time reaching out to Ian Sims, publicly and privately pressuring him to reveal the location of her daughter's body. Sadly, it was a secret that Sims would take to his grave. He was released in early 2019, but died on June 24th of 2022, having never confessed to Helen's murder. In July 2008, a marble bench was placed on the grounds of Billinge's Catholic Church to mark what would have been Helen McCourt's 43rd birthday. It's a small gesture, but one that ensures that she'll never be forgotten. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night, and I'd love to see you there. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data. Look at it anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, millennials are top G, no cap.